Welcome to the premiere episode of the Captains of Craft podcast on this Thursday, February 18th, 2021. The Captains of Craft podcast is designed for those who love everything craft beer and are interested in learning more about the process. Using interview-style questions while promoting discussion, the podcast will feature a variety of local small breweries in Maine. Today's episode features local favorite Flight Deck Brewing Company located at 11 Atlantic Avenue in Brunswick, Maine, built into a former small arms shooting range that at one point belonged to the since-closed Brunswick Naval Air Station. This brewery is decorated with equipment used by retired Navy pilots, as well as a large variety of naval aircraft-themed beers, both in cans and on tap. This morning, I had the pleasure of sitting down with co-founder Nate Wilds and was able to ask some questions about how the brewery came to be and how it has become so popular within the local community. Nate, how are you doing today? Good morning. I'm well. Thanks for the honor of being episode one. Yeah, I'm I'm super happy to be here. I'm very excited. Um, So essentially, what I kind of like to do with this podcast is kind of hear the stories of each place that I visit. You know, I've been to Flight Deck many times. It's it's one of my actual favorite places to be. Oh, thank you. Um, so, if if you wouldn't mind, just like, how did this whole operation start? Yeah. Well, the short the short version is that uh, there's a very long version, but I'll give you the very short version, which is uh, we're so we're sitting in uh, the in Flight Deck Brewing, which is our facility on Brunswick Landing. Brunswick Landing is the former Brunswick Naval Air Station, which operated as a Navy base for uh, the better part of a century, uh, just post World War II. Uh, all the way through 2011, uh, when the base was formally closed and the the Navy left. Um, When the base closed and became Brunswick Landing, uh, the vision for the Navy facilities that were left behind were all over the place from housing to uh, some public use in terms of schools and retirement facilities and a lot in between. Um, So we at uh, at Flight Deck came about, uh, my my wife, Jamie Pacheco, was running uh, a restaurant called New Beat Market, which was started out here as a as a project in collaboration with some nonprofits that worked with youth uh, and the recognition that there are a lot more businesses relocating to the landing. At, at the time, it was still pretty nascent. Uh, half the facilities were empty out here, uh, but the other half were getting filled up pretty quick. And she saw an opportunity to work with kids who uh, needed and had the opportunity for greater support to learn life skills and work skills and to provide food for the, for the growing business population. And this was back in uh, 2015 or so. And so in 2015, uh, you know, half the facilities were empty. Jamie was running the restaurant, uh, and to support her, I wasn't involved day to day in the restaurant. Um, but just as a as a supportive spouse, we saw living in the community enormous opportunity for more retail uh, and consumer access businesses out here on the landing. Um, we felt it. There was an enormous sense of community. There are a lot of young families wandering around on the weekends looking for recreational opportunities, etc. Uh, And yet we weren't really hearing or seeing or feeling uh, interest from the business community. And so I started shopping around uh, to, at the time, I was simply an avid consumer of local craft beer. Um, Though there wasn't a lot of craft breweries out here in Brunswick. Uh, There weren't any in Brunswick at the time. Um, And there certainly weren't any uh, tap rooms in the area that had a similar culture to what you might find in downtown Portland. And so in an effort to boost the restaurant business, I was trying to find a a partner or brewery who would be interested in relocating the landing. And I struck out for about 18 months. I couldn't find anyone that would even take me seriously at the time because no one believed that there was opportunity out here on the landing. Uh, And so very quickly, uh, it turned into one of those, well, if if no one else will do it, I guess, uh, who who better than us? Uh, And uh, that was, uh, um, at the time, it was a pretty naive thing to think. But um, we said, well, what the heck, we'll we'll at least put together a business plan. We'll see what happens. And so my then co-founder, who has since left the business, but uh, he he and I, at the time, uh, threw together a plan and said, hey, what does this area need? Well, let's start with the fact that we know there's an opportunity for craft beer. But more importantly, there's a really high demand for casual gathering space. We're fortunate in Brunswick to have an enormously uh, robust restaurant scene. Yeah. Uh, but restaurants are, by by definition, a little bit more formal. When you go in, you get seated. You never, it, you know, the culture in a restaurant is not one where you might turn to the person next to you and just strike up a conversation. Yeah. Uh, you're there to, to eat at your own table, and that's about it. Yeah. And there was no other casual gathering space that we knew was successful and was an important part of the growing culture and welcoming part of uh, of. Port- Portland and many other metropolitan areas across the country. And so we started with the facility and the atmosphere we wanted to cultivate, which was casual, which was family friendly, which was dog friendly, which was, uh, you know, we wanted to lower the barrier to say, this is not a 21 plus bar yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. This is a venue that we want families to be able to gather at. Yeah. And the venue can be made possible because of beer. 
Uh, but we didn't want it to start with the fact that it's all about alcohol. We yeah. wanted it to start with the fact that it's all about gathering and being together. And you gotta have you gotta have the dog friendly environment. I mean, um, so so many so many places that I've been to don't allow like the dogs. But you know, you have the outdoor patio, and in the summertime when like the doors are open here. It's like being outside the entire time kind of thing. So it's it's really cool vibe. Kind Runs of like screen porch. Yeah, exactly. Someone called it. <laughs> yeah. And go, going back to, you had mentioned um, there was not a presence of craft brewing yeah. in Brunswick. I, I moved here about five years ago. Yep. Um, and I remember when this place opened. And it seemed like over the last five years when you not only spearheaded just like the craft brewing industry in Brunswick alone because the rest started to kind of come after the fact like you were you were the first here um, but I feel like in a way it also kind of shaped across like the entire state not just Brunswick when it was just like this gigantic boom of the craft brewing industry but like kind of what I'm saying is, is that you were the first one here and then the rest kind of followed suit in Brunswick, uh, chronologically, that's true. Though it's um, to put it in perspective, uh, you know, we are number we our brewery license is number eighty eight in the state, which means that we are the eighty eighth licensed uh, craft brewery in the state of Maine. There are currently over and I haven't checked in a couple of months. There were over one hundred and fifty last I checked. So, yeah. so put it, you know, we're sort of smack dab in the middle, yeah. if you will, in uh, in the the startup sequence of breweries. The vast majority of those, I think number 30 happened in 2012, yeah. 2013. So in, in less than 10 years, uh, you know, 80% of the breweries that exist in Maine uh, started, never mind grew, right? Yeah. And a lot of those breweries, like Allagash has been around forever. Yeah. Um, Allagash just, you know, their, their tasting room, the ability for folks to go in and drink beer at Allagash is a relatively new thing. Mm-hmm. And that's partly, we can get into the legal side of that if you want, but uh, the, the important thing there is that we were only able to open and we were only able to get a footing because of the breweries that came before us and because of the enormous industry support. We're very fortunate. One of the best parts about being in the brewing uh, industry is the industry is incredibly collaborative, incredibly um, uh, uh, friendly environment to be in. Um, we are, you know, from a business perspective, you might call us competitors between different breweries. But that's really not how we do business. And yeah. we, we all recognize and we've all felt the, that we are not competitors in competing for people to come and drink our beer. We are only competitors uh, in that we are both breweries and that and the, the competition stops there. And that in Brunswick, uh, for example, we're fortunate to be one of three breweries in Brunswick now, and there are a few other breweries on the neighboring towns that have opened up in recent months and years. Uh, but our, our fellow breweries here in Brunswick, Moderation Brewing Company in downtown, and then Black Pug Brewing, which is uh, equidistant between here and, and downtown uh, Brunswick, um, we're, we saw our business go up when they opened, and that's because we Brunswick turned from, oh yeah, they have a brewery, <laughs> yeah. to, oh, I'm going to go uh, check out the breweries in Brunswick. Uh, yeah. And so before we had to, before there were any other breweries here, we had to pitch ourselves as Flight Deck, and we happened to be in Brunswick. There's an enormous uh, benefit to everyone by being able to say, Brunswick is now a brewery destination. And when folks are coming through on vacation, we know that Brunswick is right on the Route 1 corridor here, so anybody heading up the coast... Uh, has to come by all three breweries at some point in time. And so there's an, a great opportunity to leverage, not just to capture that uh, stopping for a pit stop traffic, but to remind folks that Brunswick and our community here can be their destination. You know, they don't have to go anywhere else. There's a lot to do here. And we're fortunate that this is largely true across the state, but especially here in Brunswick, that each brewery uh, is a very distinct experience. And you won't find that in a lot of other places across the country. Um, but in Maine, the culture in the brewing industry is very supportive of the fact that a new brewery is not necessarily new competition. Uh, a new brewery, if done distinctly and offers not just distinct beer, but a distinct experience when you go to visit them, that has a, has a benefit to everyone. Yeah. And so we're fortunate in Brunswick that Moderation, Black Bug, and Flight Deck, all three of us make very different beer. Uh, our focus is very different. We have different packaging options different in terms styles. of how to drink it, different yeah. styles. And when you go to physically visit our venues, uh, you know, very different experiences inside, different accommodations and, and reasons for going there. Uh, and so we're fortunate that uh, we, we have all the ability to market market each other. And by marketing each other as a destination, we all benefit. Yeah. And actually kind of taking a step even deeper there where you're talking about the relationship between um, different breweries rather than competitiveness is collaboration. Um, I remember this past summer, there was a collaboration, I think, with 
a brewery in Freeport. What was, or what develops those relationships to do yeah. collaboration efforts with other breweries? Yeah, um, and in fact, probably the best example of that this past year was the Maine Brewers Guild had a statewide collaboration here that every brewery had the opportunity to participate in, and that was to raise money for our guilds, which traditionally, our guild is the, is the organization that represents the whole industry, yep. both in terms of government affairs and legislation and all that important legal stuff. Uh, all the way down to supporting um, that marketing component that I talked about. You know, we're doing that as Brunswick, but as a state, um, we can market ourselves as a, as a brewery destination for folks who visit us. It's vacation land after all, right? We yeah, have right, right. 40 million people who visit us every year for vacation in Maine, and we, we should, uh, and the Guild does its, uh, plays an important role in making sure that a disproportionate percentage of those visitors uh, stop at at least one brewery while they're here visiting and spend some money. Um, so yeah, the collaboration part is is a is sort of how we walk the walk, right? It's easy to support each other and uh, and say it, you know when we get a text or a call from somebody with a technical question that wondering if we had solved for it before or somebody might be short in ingredient and wondering if someone else has a bag of X available. Uh, a lot of that happens, and we're more than happy to support each other because that's a two way street. If we've got something today, tomorrow we're going to need something. Uh, so we're very conscious of supporting our neighbors when we can. Uh, but the collaboration beer is really a way of taking that that mindset and putting it in uh, an enjoyable consumable format so yeah. and a collaboration beer is a great um, it's a great opportunity to work with others um, and to learn from each other it's an apprenticeship at someone else's brewery in large part uh, and then but it's also important to, to remind our communities and remind our, our loyal customers that um, you know this isn't just something we do behind the scenes this is something we we promote outside of it and so the ability to brew a beer in conjunction and collaboration with someone else, whether it's at our facility or at their facility, or sometimes it's a combination of both, um, is a great learning opportunity for us as professionals and, and brewing experts, but it's also uh, a great opportunity to share the fruits of that labor with, yeah. uh, with our friends and, and neighbors. So, so if um, with that collaboration beer that the Guild did, um, it was one recipe that everybody, everybody kind of pitched in on. Um, were you right. able were you able to put your individual label on that or was it just yeah so um, great question so uh, the label was the same but whenever we for um, the label was the same on the front but every brewery had their own logo on the side so a lot of folks uh, went around collecting the label so at the front you met the the design was the same on the front by design because we wanted wanted that uh, unification to, to really show um, and on the back you could see the logo of the brewery that made the beer yeah. and that's important to differentiate because while it's the same recipe it's a great this was a good a great exercise in demonstrating why uh, why beer is a science and an art combined yeah. Uh, because even if you start with the same spreadsheet, the same recipe, right? Uh, it's it's kind of like cooking stir fry at home, right? Yeah. If you cook, a, uh, if you use slightly different uh, soy sauce, or you use a slightly, say you have an electric oven versus a gas oven, you use a wok versus a cast iron skillet versus a uh, a pancake pan, right? You've got all these different uh, things. While the recipe might be the same, the product is going to turn out a little bit differently, right? So we, you know, our our heating source on the it sounds silly to some, but the idea of using electricity as we do to heat. Um, to heat our water and to heat our, our and to produce beer, um, that produces different a uh, different level of control for the brew house, but it also produces different. It can produce different flavors at different st uh, at different process points than say natural gas or propane, where many other breweries use. So um, it's an example. And leave all that aside, water. So yeah. we're fortunate in Maine that uh, everyone has good water, uh, and you, but as everyone knows, you know. Water in uh, in Portland tastes a little bit than, different than water in, in Brunswick. Mm -hmm. If you have them side by side, you might might be able to taste a little couple different. They're both great water. We're fortunate, man. Everyone has good water, but they're still a little bit different. And the process of making beer, very very small differences in water chemistry make a significant impact on the flavor of the beer. And that's how other ingredients uh, 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 interact with the mineral content within the water. Um, and that's also uh, yeah. So there's a lot of science behind that. Yeah. But the short version is water is a really important source. Mm -hmm. Uh, and a really Im impactful thing on the flavor of the beer. Mm -hmm. And so breweries in Portland, even if we have the exact same brew system, if the exact same brewer, if every th every factor was controlled for, which by the way is basically impossible. Well, let's say theoretically we did that. Yeah. And we simply use different water. The beer would be night and day different. Yeah. And so it was a great exercise in saying, all right, we're, we're, we have the same intention here and that we want this to be a, in this case, it was a New England style IPA. Mm -hmm. We all use the same hops, but we all use different water. We had different heating sources. We produced it in different volumes. So yeah. some people made a very small amount. Some people made a very big amount. All those things were different. But the recipe stayed the same. And yet the beers were, uh, were all great IPAs, but they're all different IPAs. Yeah. That's the fun part is that yeah, nobody wants to have the same beer twice. 
and this is a good example of even if you tried to make the same beer twice, you're not going to succeed. So in a nutshell, it's not as simple as just pouring a whole bunch of smart That's water right. into a vat and you know trying to change the recipe that way. But you know, I I can personally vouch through trying all the different like I, I would go to different breweries and try the collaboration, mm -hmm. and each one would have a slightly different flavor, and it was it was like it piqued my curiosity because I'm thinking like. It's the same label, but how how is it that they have just like subtle differences? Yeah. And I think you know a lot of people, not just myself, are very interested in the brewing process um, and like how how these ideas are created and then executed. And that kind of brings me to my next uh, my next question. Um, enlighten me, if you will. What was your pilot beer here? The first the first ever first release. ever recipe brewed. Uh, Let's see. So I can't, honest to goodness, I cannot remember the first beer we produced, mm -hmm. uh, but I can remember the first three we had on tap, uh, which was our P3 Pale Ale, uh, our Sub Hunter Imperial IPA, and our Rye Wing Porter. Yep. And those three, um, and then quickly after that, we had beers like T56, our Hibiscus Tea Beer. Um, all the beers that we started with back in two, that early 2017, all of those recipes have evolved over time, uh, but they all stayed true to the original intent. And I say evolved, and what? why did they evolve? Uh, simply because every time we make a beer, we ask ourselves, we have a sensor here with the team, uh, we talk about the process, we talk about what went well, what went, di what didn't go well, uh, if there were challenges along the way. And we talk about uh, how could we improve this? Yeah. So it's not to say how do we change it, it's how do we improve it. And so things like T56 at the beginning, the first, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say the first three batches of T56 were entirely different beers each time almost, right? You can tell they were the same beer, but the, yeah, the yeah. color was slightly different, the flavor was slightly different, like a little more cinnamon in this one, a little less cinnamon in the next one, for example. Uh, it was still T56, but it was, more, it was more variable as we were trying to dial in what makes this beer special and what makes this beer unique such that if we keep making this year after year, uh, we can uh, routinely either provide people with the same beer or a better beer year over year. Yeah. So same with P3 Pale Ale. We ask ourselves every time. Sometimes it's sourcing slightly different malt, yeah. changing the process. Occasionally we tweak the hop profile a little bit. Uh, not to introduce change for the sake of change, but to refine the beer and to be more pure in its spirit, yeah. uh, which is the, the art of the beer, right? And scientifically, it's fairly routine to produce the same beer over time over time, but the whole point of beer is to create a sensory experience and to create a, a visceral, uh, for our standpoint, is to cultivate a community experience. Yeah. And so we ask ourselves those questions of how can this beer facilitate a more wow experience for the person drinking it independently, as well as a group of people that come in and want to celebrate something together. How can we use this beer to support that occasion? Yeah, and something, like as far as like recipes that you've been doing for years, like the P3 and the Sub Hunter, like changes are made to try and make that recipe better. Because I remember with the Sub Hunter, you turned it into the Triple Threat Sub Hunter, yeah. which then became a triple, what was it, Dry Hop IPA. Yep. And that's a variation of Sub Hunter. Yeah, we still yeah. have the core Sub Hunter brand, but uh, that's the, and that's coming back actually uh, in a couple weeks here. We've yeah. got the second annual Triple Threat Sub Hunter, which is that's awesome. Sub Hunter times three in many ways. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a personal, I'm a big fan of it. But oh, um, does changing, changing those recipes um, usually show more of a positive response or does it really depend on the type of beer? Uh, yeah, great question because that, that's, you know, if people love a beer, they don't want to have that beer change, right? And so what we're very, we don't make changes for the sake of making changes and we're very conscious to cultivate a lot of customer feedback before any tweaks are made to that recipe. Um, for Sub Hunter, for example, what we found over time after making that beer, at this point we've made that beer hundreds of times, yep. uh, we get a lot of, we, we're very careful to ask uh, discerning questions that can yield actual, uh, that can yield actionable feedback for us. For example, um, people love the beer, great. Uh, understanding what do they love about it, what about the hot profile, what about the uh, the rich malty flavors do they love mm -hmm. and what we found in cultivating feedback there is that folks loved that beer um, but they loved very specific elements of the beer and so we could take a great beer and make it amazing if we downplayed the 10% of stuff that folks didn't really care about or they didn't really find to be an important component of that beer 
and played up the ones they did. So for example, the Sub Hunter, what we did is we downplayed the bitterness on the back end of the beer. Uh, so when you drank, we drank a beer when it, after you swallow, you get this sort of residual uh, bitterness on your tongue. Yep. Uh, we downplayed that a little bit in Sub Hunter because what we found, uh, and, and it was received very well, because what we found was the, it was the initial sip of Sub Hunter that was wowing people. It was the initial visceral aromas, it was the initial hop flavors, it was the smoothness. Uh, of the beer, uh, the first time you tasted it, the second time you tasted it, uh, but it wasn't the residual bitterness that wowed people. So we said, well, let's just make that wow, let's add some exclamation points onto that wow. Yeah. And we can do that by tweaking the bitterness a little bit, so it's not getting rid of it, it's not changing the elements of the beer, but it's it's 5 or 10% here and there, on the down on the bitterness, and 5 or 10% up on the hot profile, yeah. and the aromas of the beer. And so, without a doubt, it's still sub hunter. Yeah. But the true test was when we put a new batch on tap, we do a combination of uh, telling a customer that it's different and asking for their feedback and blindly giving it to customers who routinely order that beer and saying, what do you think? And Or asking them for their feedback on this batch yeah. without telling them what changed. Yeah. And so that's the true test. And, and you know, once in a while we get a batch where it's a mixed, mixed bag of like, oh, I loved it before. This is still good, but I loved it before. Um, but we, most of the time, because of, we're so diligent about that process, that development process, we're able to get results of saying, uh, I don't know what you did, but it's even better. Or right. there's more of what I loved about that beer. And that's the goal for all those processes, is to, is to understand what people love, to amplify those things, yeah. and, and to keep iterating. So and to change so things 5% at a time. Kind of that fun blind taste test thing that you were talking about. Right. Someone orders a Sub Hunter, and when you pour the triple threat version of the Sub Hunter, the color might be a little bit darker, but not enough for the eye to really notice. And then it's, I guess, the flavor would probably be a little bit more potent. Is that a way to describe it? Yeah, so with Triple Threat, uh, exactly right. So we took the, the spirit of Sub Hunter. What, what's the spirit of Sub Hunter? It's a 9.1% Imperial IPA. Uh, it's, a, it's a big IPA. It's a hefty boy. It's a hefty boy that uh, EOI, that, uh, that is in the spirit of the old world IPA. So it's not the juice bomb, you know, orange and tangerine and mango blended together with, yeah. you know, some cranberry juice on top. Uh, it's not at all that. It's in the spirit of the old world IPA, uh, such that it's it's big, it's smooth, it's decadently hoppy, but not in the bright, juicy way. It's yeah. robust across the board. So it's it's not at all like Dogfish Head 60 Minute, but we hop it similarly in that the, the reason that Dogfish Head 60 Minute is so such a robust beer is because so many different hops are added at, at so many different times, continuously in their case, throughout the boil process. So yeah. Self Hunter would take a similar approach to not just to introduce a different hop, but to introduce a different style of hopping that gives it a very robust, very full, uh, full body to drinking experience, um, and that's why we call it an imperial IPA. Because when you say IPA these days, uh, when in Maine, when you get an IPA at a Maine brewery, you expect something that's a bit juicy, a bit hazy, and that's a traditional New England style IPA. Uh, with Sub Hunter, we're very we want to distinguish that from our New England style IPAs like Wings or our West Coast Space A. You know, Sub Hunter is very distinct in that if you expect a Maine IPA uh, when you drink Sub Hunter, you're going to be disappointed. If you expect a uh, a really robust drinking experience that happens to be called an IPA, uh, you're going to be delighted. Yeah, right? it's going to hit the nail right on the head. Um, and kind of going, you were talking about like the boiling process for Sub Hunter, but kind of looking not at all of them because there's so many beers, but the, how long does the average process for making one batch of beer um, take, and how much does that usually yield? as far as what's needed. Yeah, so right now, so the grain to glass process, in other words, from the standpoint of, uh, I'm going to start making this beer, to I can pour this beer in a glass and have it enjoyed the way I intend it to be, uh, at least two weeks, sometimes upwards of five or six weeks, depending on the style of the beer, uh, and depending on, uh, yeah, depend, largely depending on the style. Um, and so meaning a, a uh, fairly malt forward, uh, not a lot of hops, uh, you know, pub beer or a light pale ale, etc. That's on the shorter end of the spectrum time-wise, to use that as an example. A dry hops New England IPA typically takes, we, we allow it to take about three weeks. Um, with most beer, if you, you know, adding, a, you don't want to rush beer period, yeah. um, but the more hops you add into something, the less you want to rush that even more. Yeah. Hops are very are a very delicate component that uh, if you don't allow it to do uh, to fully um, 
you got to let it do what it needs to do in yeah. the right amount of time. You can't really rush a lot of these processes to fit your own timeline. Mm -hmm. uh, so New England style IPAs take, you know, roughly for us take about three, three and a half weeks. We choose to spread the process out that much. And then we go look at lagers or pilsners or, or slower fermenting beers. That can take upwards of four or five months. Uh, excuse me, four or five weeks, not four or five months. Don't worry. What's going on? That's what I'm doing. That's dedication <laughs> right there. But barrel aging takes months, right? And that's, yeah. That's where you can, uh, when you get a, a bourbon barrel aged, fill in the blank beer, right? Typically that, that at minimum is a month. Uh, and the longer you leave it in the barrel, typically the more robust the flavors you get from it. So those take months. Yeah. Um, but we, we assume on average two and a half to three weeks for most of our beers. Awesome. Awesome. And, um, a very, you know, it's it's been one heck of a year as far as COVID goes, um, but it doesn't seem like, aside from like the COVID guidelines that need to happen, um, it doesn't seem like you've really had to change your game all that much as far as people coming to the tasting room, sitting outside. I mean, obviously this time of year, people don't want to sit outside, but, you know, you have fire pits outside on the patio and, you know, portable heaters. So how, how has flight deck adapted to the challenge of COVID? Yeah, uh, we're, first off, we're very fortunate in that if you were to design a brewery <laughs> to be uh, relatively pandemic friendly, we might not design a building too different than what we have in that we've got a very tall ceiling, uh, so it's roughly uh, 20 feet, 21 feet high. So there's a lot of uh, inherent airflow there. We've got a central uh, HVAC system, we've got ceiling fans, we've got uh, portable uh, HEPA filters throughout the building. Um, so we're able to move a lot of air inside, even with all the doors shut. But on top of the, a lot of headspace and having a lot of air for the number of people in here, um, we also have enormous overhead doors that we love to open up as much as humanly possible. Um, it's difficult in the winter, but certainly when the weather is above freezing, we have them open more often than not. And that natural airflow has been incredibly uh, uh, welcoming for all of us, uh, safe for our team to work. Um, the airflow is important, the UV rays from the sun are important, all those things that we know now about COVID mitigation techniques. So we're fortunate that uh, we've been able to maintain uh, not regular service, certainly we've had to change a lot, but for example, you can't sit at our bar. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, we have half as many people in here as we, as we could normally, Yeah. Um, which are all necessary steps to maintain safety for for us as well as the customers, but we're, we've been able to stay open and, and knock on wood, we've been able to keep our team fully employed. Uh, not only fully employed, we've actually had to add a couple people to our team. We've been very fortunate in that uh, we've been able to, uh, you know, we're not, uh, we're certainly not, business is not, um, COVID did not help our business, <laughs> as, as I think that's the universal truth, but yeah, I, don't, I don't think a single business would say that COVID's been beneficial no. in any way. Um, we but, try to take a what doesn't, and I hate to use this phrase, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yeah. And I don't mean to, um, I mean, COVID is a deadly disease, and so I don't mean to make light of that. I just mean in, in the business sense, uh, what doesn't put it out, put us out of business will make us stronger in the future. It's probably yeah. the best way of saying that. And, and so we're trying to learn what, you know, a lot of these things like clean air inside. Well, the air is a lot, you know, we're running HEPA filters, we're, we're circulating more air than ever before. We didn't have air quality problems before, but it's certainly better now. Yeah. We're not going to take that away yeah. when, when everyone's vaccinated, right? So all, all these things that are that are good for our health, even without COVID, um, we're going to remember and we're going to keep doing. Yeah. Uh, we hope to goodness that, uh, you know, soon we can welcome people back to sit at our bar, which is a beautiful King's Pine Live Edge uh, structure that... Um, that we've got a lot of regulars that miss doing that. So we hope, that, you know, uh, experiences like that can come back when it's safe. Yeah. Um, but we're also cognizant that we're, you know, we've learned a lot. Yeah. We learned how to package more beer, you know. The biggest change for us, frankly, was that we accelerated our, our two to three year plan out involved. You know, we anticipated buying a new canning line within the next 24 months. We did that six months after COVID hit uh, because we recognized that putting beer in cans, we're not moving nearly as many glasses of beer in, in our facility. So we've got to get the beer out to more people. Yeah. Um, so we accelerated the, the plan that we had for two or three years and we scrunched it together to, to make do. And so it'll certainly change how we handle the next couple of years, but we've got an awesome team. And I yeah. keep coming back to that. The, the fact that, you know, we can, we can be nimble as a business, but uh, your, your business is only as nimble as the people who are working within it. And so I'm so fortunate to be, to have a, a team that um, not only uh, is okay with being nimble and taking it day by day, but frankly is excited by that prospect and is uh, ha they have really thrived in the environment of uh, look we, we've we have we're fortunate to have the resources we're fortunate to be in an industry that we want to work in yeah. I mean it's beer for gosh sakes right? Yeah, right I mean if we're if we're coming to work hating our life we've got to do something differently we've got to work in beer how cool is that right yeah. 
Yeah. So keep checking, gut checking ourselves that for gosh sakes, it's it, not, it, you know? Like, not, not to say this in a, like, weird way, but with COVID happening, beer became, or just pretty much any, like, alcohol became yeah. higher in demand because, you know, people are at home, they, yep. they want to enjoy themselves while they're at home kind of thing, so... That also, I noticed, transitioned into a delivery system mm -hmm. from the brewery to your door kind of thing. Yep. Um, how does that work so far? Yeah, home delivery has been a really important part of staying connected with regulars. Um, you know, we've, in Greater Brunswick, we've got a pretty diverse population, and uh, for Maine, a diverse population, relatively speaking, um, in many senses, but especially on age demographics, we're, we're pretty diverse, and that Maine's an old state, generally. Uh, Brunswick has a great combination of young families moving here, coupled with uh, some really robust and, and thriving retirement communities, um, literal retirement communities, but also communities that are largely filled with retirees. Yeah. Um, and so we're, we're conscious of the fact that a lot of our regulars, a lot of people we saw on a, a, on a even on an irregular basis, were, were of the age where placed them in a specifically high risk demographic, you know, above the age of 65, 70. Uh, and and or uh, these are the same folks even without COVID that are less likely to come out in the winter yeah. uh, for safety reasons. So uh, we developed a home delivery method with them in mind. What we found was that a lot of people utilize it throughout the year. Uh, as as we're now seeing on the macroeconomic scale, um, you know, home delivery and uh, the ability to to um, to buy pretty much everything via e-commerce is changing our habits uh, not just for safety but also for convenience and uh, changing our ability to, to get the products we want when we want them yeah and so we're we have no intention of taking that away when COVID goes away um, in that uh, what we've learned is that there are a lot of customers that um, don't you know want to enjoy a quality product and appreciate that level of service uh, that would not visit us with or without COVID yeah and so uh, it's a great opportunity to bring a product to people that are not physically able to leave their house, are not, uh, you know, sometimes their family circumstances, they can't, they don't have childcare, you know, they just can't make it out. And so, um, for us as a small business in the community, it's, it's, uh, we see it as a great opportunity to, to, um, keep our folks employed and to keep some product moving out there. Um, but honestly, it, we, we wouldn't be as excited about this if it didn't mean, if it wasn't so meaningful to our friends and neighbors. And, and that's that the point of feedback of going to someone's home and, and talking to them from six plus feet away. Typically, we leave the beer on their doorstep, step back, they open the door, and we have a, have a conversation. Um, we gotta check their ID and all that, all that good stuff. But the, the, the interaction, even if it's not around a table, uh, the interaction and affirmation that our neighbors are are doing okay, yeah. and uh, and not only doing okay, but they're they're still excited to be a part of this community. That's been a, um, a real driver for us, and so that's it's as much a spiritual, uh, emotional uh, line of business for us as it is one about moving, moving beer. That's awesome. That's awesome. And this is you know this has been great information. One last topic I'd like to ask you about is I think Flight Deck just took a big step as far as sustainability goes. I know a lot of breweries are trying to move in towards a sustainable direction. Mm -hmm. um, what, what has Flight Deck done recently um, as far as, like, I know that there were some upgrades that happened, um, like installations. So what, what has happened in the last couple weeks? Yeah. Um, but what a tease. That's a great softball. Uh, so in the last couple weeks, what's happened, and I, uh, I'll, I'll give it away and then we can go back in time a little bit. But what's happened in the last couple weeks is we covered our, our whole roof with uh, solar panels. And that was a that was a um, continued investment in in renewable energy for us that started before we opened. So one of the reasons that we're excited to be here on Brunswick Landing uh, is that the landing itself, within a few hundred yards of our brewery, there are there's a massive uh, photovoltaic array, solar electricity generation on the tarmac. There's a uh, device called an anaerobic biodigester, which takes uh, sewage from uh, the town of Brunswick. Uh, and waste from manufacturers like us, so some of our waste uh, brewing materials goes to them, and they use enzymes and, and anaerobic digestion uh, to produce methane, which powers a uh, turbine to generate electricity. So it's a renewable source of electricity generation using waste products from That's folks cool. like us, which is very cool. And we've got uh, a lot of wind credits that come online to support the grid here as well. Yeah. So. In other words, when we started out, uh, it was true back in 2017, and it remains true today, 100% of the electricity we use in our facility is comes from renewable sources. And to us, that was uh, philosophically important. That was um, 
uh, the right thing to do for uh, the planet and our community. It was also good business because it costs us more money right now to use electricity to make beer than it would natural gas. So we're, we're writing a bigger check every month than not. So at face value, you might say, well, then what, you know, that seems like bad business. Well, uh, our bet is not, we're not a quarter to quarter publicly traded company. We're, we're investing in our community. We're investing in a, in a livelihood for our team over the long term. Uh, just as we believe, you know, climate change or climate action is not something you do uh, today for results tomorrow. We've got to do, uh, act we've got to take action today. Yes, for tomorrow, but more importantly, for 10, 100 years from now. And so our business uh, justification for investing in renewable energy is that over the long term, as we produce more energy ourselves on site, uh, we've got to write a, a, a check, or in this case, we raise some money to put solar panels on a roof. So it's a lot of cash up front, but in 10 years, that's a lot of free electricity that we're going to be getting. Yeah. That ROI is yeah. not, not, not that far away. And so from a business case, we're spending a little bit more money now to have a lot less money going out the door in five or 10 years. And so for us as an organization, you know, we're not we're not focused on uh, on next month's uh, profit. We're focused on being a sustainable organization that can keep our team employed uh, for as long as they're as long as we're fortunate to have them and building careers here. Uh, you know, good paying jobs that they can sustain their own families on. And so for us, investing in things that have a good ROI over five, 10, 15, 20 years uh, makes infinite sense. And so. Between solar panels on the roof, we've got uh, electric vehicle chargers out front with complimentary electricity for folks with EVs. That was an early investment we made back when, I think that's been in, uh, that was back in 2018. Uh, and in 2018, there, were, there weren't a lot of EVs on the road. Uh, and as, as anybody reading the news these days will hear, 2021 is going to be a big year for EVs, and it's only going to get more prevalent. Yeah. And so that was an early investment for us, but it's it's one that um, that we felt was important, not because we had EVs, but because we knew a growing number of our customers would. And we want to be able to support the fact that uh, you should not have to compromise your own investments to, in order to come and, and enjoy our space. Yeah. And so as, as forward thinking as we can be in our, in our small business uh, capacity here, um, we're trying to at least demonstrate that it's possible and to walk the walk and not in addition to talking the talk. Awesome. Yeah, I just found myself being educated on there was even much more on that subject that I didn't even notice like with the visual eye kind of thing. So awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining me today on the podcast. Um, thank you, Dave. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. And, let's uh, get a beer. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> All right. Cheers.